And today, I am so excited and honored uh, that we are having Zoe Weil present on Main Wonders. She is an accomplished author, TEDx talk presenter, and um, the president of the Institute for Humane Education. And I've been wanting to have her uh, present for, for the Wells Reserve community for such a long time. So, Zoe, take it away. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you, everybody who's here. I'm so glad that you're here. It's really fun for me to do this presentation. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I came to do it. So when I was a child, I loved animals. And like many children who grew up in the 60s and 70s, I watched National Geographic specials on TV. And I wanted to be like Jane Goodall when I grew up and work with animals and learn about animals. And when I graduated from college, I had the opportunity to work as a teacher and naturalist at a nature center and wildlife rehab center. So I did get to work with animals. And I started to realize that for me, it was more important to work for animals than with them and to also work for social justice and for environmental preservation. So I became a humane educator and I co-founded the Institute for Humane Education to teach about the interconnected issues of human rights and animal protection and environmental sustainability and create a world where all life can thrive. But my passion and appreciation for animals and nature never abated. And so when I was in the Maine Master Naturalist Program and I had the opportunity to do a capstone project, I decided to combine my love of animals and nature with my role as an educator to create this presentation. And so now I am going to share my screen with you. And I'm going to turn off my own video. And after the presentation is over, you know what? I have to stop sharing for a second because I forgot to include, yes, yeah, share sound is going to work. Um, after it's over, I'll come back and then open for questions. So my goal in this presentation is to awaken your awe and curiosity and deepen your love for nature and Maine's animals and its beauty. And I also have an ulterior motive that through that awe and love, you will find yourself ever more motivated to protect and care for other species and the natural world. Now, this presentation is divided into four sections, sex and reproduction, metamorphosis and transformation, iconic main beauty, and the weird and the wild. So it makes sense to start with sex and reproduction since that is how life begins. And I figured that if I wanted to capture your attention right away, that might also be the way to do it. And so we begin on a rainy evening in early April when the spotted salamanders emerge from their long winter under leaf litter and logs in the woods and migrate to vernal pools and ponds to congregate, which is the euphemism for salamander sex. There, they roll and twist and dance together over several nights, with the males depositing their spermatophores, the females picking them up to fertilize and then lay their eggs, and then both sexes disappearing within a week or two to return to their solitary lives in the woods. The wood frogs also arrive in April and quack like a cross between a duck and what I imagine a gnome would sound like, while the tiny spring peepers soon follow with their deafening peeps. I find it ironic that this female peeper on the right seems to be requesting some quiet during copulation as evidenced by her use of the shush sign, despite the cacophony the males must make 
to arouse the female's interest as evidenced by this video. Keepers seem to go to great lengths to achieve their goals of finding a mate, including tolerating the thorns of rugosa roses and sometimes confusing their own species with the aforementioned spotted salamanders. Next come the gray tree frogs who trill rather than peep and sound uncannily like the creatures on the Star Trek original series episode Galileo 7, at least to me. And as you watch this video, you'll hear peepers and tree frogs in the background before this tree frog does his impressive trill for you. Now, mating calls and rituals are common among birds. And here you'll see the dancing of mergansers, and the contortions of the golden eyes, and then the chattering and head bending of long tailed ducks. I sometimes wonder if these birds ever have cervical spine issues and what they do if they injure their necks through these displays. And then there are the turkeys from the ever expanding snood that changes from a pointed hat on their heads to a long dangling fleshy protuberance covering their beak to their fancy tail displays, to their drumming on the ground, they go to great lengths to impress the ladies who often seem rather bored by their displays, as you will see in this video. It's not just amphibians and birds who are mating. There's a lot of love happening in spring. And if you want to see animals mating, just go outside in April, May, and June and look for some invertebrates. You will find them mating in a variety of positions, some typical and some demonstrating impressive gymnastics moves with others like water striders mating while standing on water. Flowers don't mate, of course, but they do reproduce through pollination, and how lovely that some invertebrates are so cooperative, often mating and pollinating at the very same time. In the case of bees, they bring pollen back to their nests, as this honeybee will do after visiting this poppy. Many bees carry pollen in their bright orange pollen baskets, otherwise known as corbicula on their legs, as you can see on these bees. And the result of that bee pollination are fields of flowers like these lupin. One of the curious things about lupins is how they move throughout the day. Mostly the flowers are upright like steeples, but periodically they go a little haywire like these are, but they're practically always standing tall in the morning. When their days are done and they've gone to seed, first as fuzzy green pods and then as dry brown pods, make sure to stand very still on a hot day in late July or early August in a lupin field and just listen. You're likely to hear the pods pop, pop, popping all around you, dispersing their little brown seeds so that next year we'll have even more lupins. One of the more amazing things that you will find if you look very closely at lupins are the bajillion aphids who chew up lupin stalks over the course of a week or two. Weeks will go by with nary an aphid in a lupin field and then suddenly they are coating the stems. How does this happen so quickly? Well, aphid reproduction is nothing short of amazing. Not only are they viviparous, meaning they bear live young like we do, although they also lay eggs like other insects, but they also give birth to pregnant clones of themselves. Yes, you heard that right. You are looking at aphids who are popping out pregnant clones every 30 minutes. Now, not every plant needs an insect for pollination, 
our beautiful grasses can do the job of reproduction with just a gust of wind. Now, some slime mold spores like this chocolate tube staminitis also spread through wind, but sometimes they get a little help from their friends. And what happens when these spores, which are coming from those, which are those clouds of brown, what happens when they grow into slime molds? Well, my husband Edwin did a time lapse to demonstrate how they go from these white little balls into the chocolate tubes. Now, there are a lot of animals who are reproducing in the spring, and the megafauna are no exception. And when I took the video footage that you're watching now, I actually did feel a little bit like Jane Goodall sitting there and getting to see these harbor seals lying out, hauled out on rocks at low tide and stretching and yawning and sleeping and checking things out. And then I saw this and I didn't know what I was seeing, but what I was seeing was a seal giving birth. I was so focused on what she was doing with the seaweed that I didn't even notice. And then I took my camera away. And when I brought my camera back, there was a newborn seal pup with the placenta, which you can see um, just where the water is hitting the seaweed. And mom was so gentle and loving with her newborn seal pup. Well, of course, I had to go back the next day and there was the seal pup with mom. There were other um, pups being born as well over the course of this week. And mom was very attentive and she would nurse the little baby. And everybody seemed pretty interested around her. And of course, you got to move the baby to the other side to nurse. And you'll have to forgive the movement of my camera. I was not using a tripod. I was just holding my camera and it was all just so amazing that sometimes I would move around a lot, particularly when the seals would move and I would sort of move sympathetically. Ouch, poor little baby, but the baby doesn't seem to mind having been whacked in the head. There's the baby following not mom with mom close behind. Now, you know, it's hard enough for seals to be on the shore. They are not designed to be on land. Um, and so imagine what it's like for a newborn seal. And so a lot of times these seals, just a little bit of a stretch. And the next thing you know, they'd be toppling and falling off of the rocks and the seaweed like that. And this one, take a look at the belly as she rolls over. You'll see uh, that umbil umbilical cord still a little bit of attachment. Yeah, that's just me with sympathetic moving of my camera as the poor baby was about to roll off. But when the babies did roll off, which is about to happen, and land in the water. Everybody soon follows. Everybody is paying attention. And mom's gonna come very quickly to her baby, but she won't be the only one. There are other, gonna be other ones following, including other babies. And off they go. Now, these slides really belong in the iconic main beauty section rather than the sex and reproduction section, but I wanted to follow up that video with these photos of both Harbor and Gray Seals who get along seems to be quite well and they often haul out on the rocks together. Now, in the spring of 2021, a doe gave birth to twins and she hung out uh, on our property pretty much all summer 
and pretty much ate everything in the garden with the exception of the onions. But it was hard to begrudge her the food given what she had to endure, which was this. <laughs> I keep a close watch on this heart of mine I keep my eyes wide open all the time I keep the ends out for the tie that binds Because you're mine, I walk the line So the uh, images at the end are those same do, uh, fawns, just a little bit older. So after all that sex and eggling and birthing, for many of these animals, it's now time to turn into a larva or nymph and then metamorphose into an adult. Now, having never been a larva or nymph myself, I can only imagine how wild it would be to go through an entirely other phase of one's life. In the following slides, you'll see spotted salamander eggs growing from what I call their eyeball stage here to what I call their nutlet stage here to their development as tiny larvae with gills visible inside their eggs. And on the outside of those eggs, those are tadpoles that you're seeing. And in this photo, this is salamander larvae that are just about ready to leave their eggs. Now, in the case of gray tree frogs, I've never seen the eggs, but once they hatch into tadpoles, I usually see tons of them in our pond. And they slowly but surely grow legs, move to the bank of the pond, turn emerald green, and lose their tail. And then one day, the baby gray tree frogs climb up the bank, or on a reed and move out of the water and onto the land. And there they often gravitate to the high bush blueberries by our pond, which gives you a good scale for assessing their size. And here are two more just because I love them a lot. And of course, before long, they will be big, bumpy, funky looking adults ready to trail and start the whole process anew the following spring. Now, a presentation on metamorphosis wouldn't be complete without a discussion of monarch butterflies, so I'm going to devote some time to these creatures whose life and life cycles are a marvel. And I'll start the description in late spring and early summer when the butterflies arrive and mate and lay eggs, and the eggs hatch into caterpillars who eat and eat and eat and grow and grow and grow, and in the process shed their skin and grow some more until they are ready to shed their skin a fifth and final time and pupate into a chrysalis. Now, most summers I bring in caterpillars from our milkweed patch and put them in an aquarium and watch them pupate and then emerge. And I made this sped up video of the pupation process.
is our dried, fully formed chrysalis. And as if this transformation weren't mind boggling enough, what happens inside that chrysalis is astonishing. Over the course of one to two weeks, the caterpillar dissolves into what I can only describe as genetic goo and reforms into a butterfly. Now, I know we all know this, but let's just pause for a moment to take in just how amazing such a transformation really is. And just before it's time to emerge, you can see the folded up butterfly inside. And then it is time to break out and fly. And here's that process in a film made by my husband, Edwin Barkdahl. I feel a change in the weather, I feel a change in me The days are getting shorter and the birds begin to leave Even me, yes, yes, y'all, who's been so long alone I'm headed home, headed home Edwin has a knack for picking out just the right music for these videos, and that one was no exception. Indeed, this monarch, a male, as evidenced by the black spots on the lower left part of the lower wings, is about to head to what could be called monarch home, all the way in Mexico, thousands of miles away to a place he's never been, and his parents aren't accompanying him to show him the way. And when he gets to Mexico, He'll rest up with hundreds of thousands of other butterflies, and come late winter, he'll mate, and eggs will be laid and hatch into caterpillars who will eat and eat and eat, and then morpho metamorphose into butterflies who will fly north and then mate, and more eggs will be laid, and caterpillars will hatch and eat and eat and eat, and metamorphose into butterflies who will fly further north, and eventually butterflies will get to Maine. And our friend here's great great grandchildren will then make the journey back to Mexico. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Now, in contrast to the monarch butterfly, the Luna moth's life is brief. Luna caterpillars build a cocoon, and when the moths emerge, they have a single purpose to mate and lay eggs. They don't even have a mouth, so they cannot even eat. The males, like these, which you can tell by their big antennae, sense the female's pheromones with those antennae even a mile away, and after mating in about a week, their short lives are over. It's not just animals who transform. Maine's landscape transforms as well, and there is little that is as breathtaking as the transformation of our blueberry barrens into crimson fields in October or the colors changing in the forest, or the transformation from the colorful terrain in the fall to the crystalline winter, when our mountains, like our beloved tallest Katahdin in the photo on the right, is covered in snow and the lakes and bays freeze. And that's our dog, Poppy, who managed to get up on that slippery rock and seems quite proud of herself. Now, occasionally something happens during an odd year, like a forest flooding and freezing that one simply must take advantage of. So when that happens, it's good to drop everything and go do something you will, you will remember for the rest of your life, like this. We are now done with metamorphosis and transformation, and it's time to just bask in Maine's beauty. Now, lots of states are beautiful, but Maine is extra special. 
Sure, there are states with more majestic mountains, bigger trees, and vastly more varied life forms. There are states with deserts, canyons, and semi-tropical climates. But because Maine has such varied habitats, including our huge coastline, we get a bit of everything. For example, we can regularly experience spectacular sunrises, sunsets, and storm cloud views over the ocean. And because we're mostly rural and getting into the wilderness is pretty easy, we can frequently see the megafauna who live here. In spring and summer, we have lots of migrating songbirds visit and sometimes stay through the season, some of whom offer quite the eye candy, like this scarlet tanager on the top left and these ruby-throated hummingbirds in the middle, and some of whom are just plain cool, sporting goggles or ray-bans like the common yellow throat on the bottom left and the cedar waxwing on the right. We have lots of great blue herons who spend summers fishing in Maine, staring intently at the water before nabbing their prey, swallowing as if they're a person trying to get down a giant pill and then washing down their meals with a little salt water. And if you venture through remote ponds and bogs, you may also find their rookeries where these prehistoric looking birds perch ungainly on giant trees. And then there are the common loons. You'll find them on both lakes and in the ocean. Now, when I gave this presentation in June of 2021, I mentioned that it was on my bucket list to get a good photo of a baby loon on the back of mom or dad, because while I'd seen this, I'd never gotten a good shot. Well, I didn't expect that a couple of weeks later, I'd not only get to photograph that, but also to videotape it. And I certainly didn't expect that I'd also get to hear the loons calling at the same time. I always think that last um, little bit at the end is so funny. Like you're riding on your mom or dad's back and then they dive and oh, you're just floating on the water again. So barred outlets just might be the cutest thing you will ever see in your life. And these two newly fledged siblings on the left are just showing off their adorableness. But watching outlets does require that you stomach seeing the parents decapitate and eviscerate squirrels, moles, voles, and sometimes even snakes to feed their hungry babies. Now, a couple of years ago, I was paying close attention to this particular nest, and there were three owlets in this nest, and this is the last one. There's mom. She's in a tree nearby watching over. And one morning I came to the nest. The uh, other two siblings had already fledged, and this one was out on a branch right outside the nest. And there's really no place for an owlet to go when they uh, leave the nest other than falling to the ground. And in this case, it was about a 20 foot fall. So this owlet is looking around, <laughs> um, probably anticipating um, what's gonna come next because there really aren't a lot of options. And I did watch the outlet fall, but didn't videotape it because it was so startling. I, I just stopped videotaping. But in a moment, you will see the outlet on the ground. And the outlet just pretty much kind of bounces on the soft leaves um, with that soft little body. And mom and dad are actually quite nearby. And the siblings are up in trees, also not that far away. And these are the owlet's first steps and first flapping of wings and this owlet is going to find a tree and use her talons and her beak 
to climb up that tree to safety because being on the ground is not a safe place for a little owlet. So that's one of the siblings and that's dad grooming the sibling. And not that far away, there was another family of four owlets who were uh, born and fledged. These are two of them. You can hear them crying. And if I'm going to use my translator, these owlets are saying, feed me. And mom and dad are constantly hunting to feed their babies. There's mom. And mom is uh, very dutiful. Doesn't that look yummy? Feeding these little owlets. I'm wondering how many people are having lunch as they watch this since it's a lunchtime presentation. Hope you didn't lose your appetite there. Now, winter in Maine is not the time to stay indoors and keep warm. It's still time to go outside, especially in the snow, and look for animal tracks, and then snowshoe up mountains to look for snowy owls who fly down from the Arctic to winter here. Now, the males, like the one on the right, are almost all white. And the females and juveniles have black bars on their feathers, as you can see in the photo on the left. Now, how she is keeping her balance on that skinny little branch is beyond me, but um, she managed to hang out there for quite a while. Now, if you do decide to venture up mountains to view snowy owls, please keep your distance. If they fly away, fly away it means that you got too close. Now, Maine is home to two species of large rodents, beavers, like the one on the left, and porcupines. Now, one of the distinguishing features of rodents is they're constantly growing incisors and lack of canine teeth. Rodents must gnaw, and both beavers and porcupines are exceptional gnawers. A couple of summers ago, while I was snorkeling in a remote stream where I took the picture on the right, I had the great pleasure and surprise of having a beaver swim right under me. Now, while beavers build their lodges by the water and they dam streams to create ponds, porcupines live in and around the woods, often seeking protection from bad weather under rocks, in logs, or even under houses. And in these dens, you may find prodigious quantities of their pellet-like poop. Porcupines seem to have little concern about predators because only one predator other than people has worked out how to kill such a well-protected animal. These are fishers, large members of the mustelid or weasel family. And I was lucky enough to have one appear on a mountaintop a couple of winters ago and pose as I took the photo on the right. Now, as the story goes, and it may be somewhat apocryphal, Fishers run circles around porcupines who then turn in circles to protect themselves by keeping their backs pointed toward the fisher with their quills raised. Now, supposedly fishers make porcupines so dizzy and tire them out so much that they eventually fall over and then the fisher attacks their quillless bellies. And by the way, porcupines do not throw their quills. They are completely harmless unless you or your dog try to harm them. I have a friend to thank for introducing me to a fox den where foxes have been burying their young for decades. And in the summer of 2021, there were six kits and here are three of them. And I'm just really just upping the cuteness quotient every few minutes to keep you engaged in case stories about rodents don't appeal to you. I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't include a photo each of Maine's two most iconic animals, moose, who pretty much always look placid, and bald eagles, who pretty much always look mad. Both animals can be spotted across the state, and if you live in Maine and haven't seen them, it probably means you haven't been venturing outdoors enough. So the take-home message is go outside and explore. It's now time to wrap up our tour through Maine Wonders with the weird and wild, starting with mushrooms. This one is called a dog stinkhorn, and I'll let you guess how it got its name. And yes, it's super stinky. You can smell these mushrooms long before you see them. And that's saying something because as you can see, they are not inconspicuous. 
I'm a big fan of mushrooms. Not only have I become an avid mushroom forager, gathering and cooking them up in summer and fall and drying them for winter, but I also love the inedible and poisonous ones too, just not to eat, because they are fascinating life forms. I'm particularly fond of the blue staining beliefs, which turn indigo upon the slightest bruise, which means you can write on them and leave messages as if by magic. In the case of Gyroporus cyanescens, just exposure to air makes them turn blue instantly if you cut them in half. And as you can see in the photo on the right. Maine offers some great opportunities for observing glow in the dark life forms. Head to the shore at night when the moon is new and swish the water and you may see bioluminescent creatures who look like stars in the sea. Or head into the woods to find bioluminescent mushrooms. There's the common Pinellus stypticus that grows in perfusion on dead trees or logs and glows green, as you can see in the photo on the left. And then there are the big orange jack-o'-lanterns near the base of oaks and on stumps that glow yellow, as you can see in the photo on the right. And all of these photos were taken by my husband, who actually puts jack-o'-lantern fruiting times in his calendar so he doesn't miss the light show. Now, some mushrooms are quite inconspicuous and require getting down on your knees in the woods to find them growing out of acorn caps and pine cones, which is totally worth it. Someday I may do an entire presentation just on lichens. Lichens are amazing. They are composite organisms that arise from algae or cyanobacteria and fungi, and they are everywhere, on tree bark and logs, on the ground, on rocks in the woods, and at the shore, on bones, and on wood furniture, everywhere. And they come in so many colors and shapes and sizes. Find a patch of lichen, crouch down with a magnifying glass, and you'll feel like you've entered a Dr. Seuss book. And all of these photos of various species of Cladonia were taken on the same rock. So fairy shrimp live in vernal pools as well as hypersaline lakes across the world. And Edwin and I had been looking for fairy shrimp in vernal pools for years and years and years, and we never found them. And then our friend and main master naturalist Karen Zimmerman took us to her spot on Mount Desert Island where she had seen them many times before and there they were. So we very carefully gathered a few of these tiny little crustaceans and we put them in a tub for a short time so that we could take photos and videotape and observe them. And got to see them swimming upside down and spiraling and doing what's called a metachronal rhythm, which you just got to see. Now, these fairy shrimp only live for about six to eight weeks, during which time they mate and they lay eggs. And when their pools dry up, the eggs become dormant. And those eggs can withstand droughts, frost, complete desiccation, and even exposure to UV radi radiation. They can even survive the vacuum of space and be viable for centuries. And you can see the eggs um, on this one and the metachronal rhythm. So now it's time to head to tide pools rather than vernal pools. Life in these pools is fragile and we can cause quite a bit of harm stepping on animals we may not even realize are animals. All those barnacles at low tide are living beings. So it's really a good thing to be careful and try not to walk on them and to walk on bare rocks instead. And if you've never seen a living barnacle, this is one feeding in a tiny little pool. And that clear disc, that is a fish scale. Now at low tide, you're likely to see lots of hermit crabs who are territorial animals who occupy the shells of dead mollusks like periwinkles and often fight one another. Some of them have what appear to be orange, pink, or rust colored shells, but if you look closely, you'll discover that their shells are actually covered in what's called snail fur or Hydractinia echinata, which is a kind of colonial hydroid related to jellyfish. Snail fur is also related to tubular hydroids 
like these who look like pink flowers. And these two are animals. And if you find them, you may find nudibranchs for whom the hydroids are a food source. Now, nudibranchs like these pellucid aeolus are a kind of sea slug, but I just prefer to call them nudies. And here's a different kind of nudibranch, a robust frond nudie laying eggs in a fast moving current. And I honestly don't know how those eggs are going to stick onto the frond in the current. Now, full grown nudibranchs are small and baby nudies, well, you'll want to get out that magnifying glass to see them. On the left, you can see two baby nudibranchs on an Arctic lyre crab. And in the photo on your right, that's my pinky finger to give you a sense of size. Now, these are not photos of a design for a colorful quilt. They're actually pictures of tunicates, which is another kind of colonial animal. The golden star tunicates on the left and the orange sheath tunicates on the right usually cover rocks and sometimes shells and seaweed as well. Now, they're generally thought of as invasive species in Maine, and I'll admit that there are times in late summer when they cover a lot and do seem to be taking over, but they generally come and go over the season, and I've never seen them truly take over an area. Now, at low tide, you may spot something that looks like a blob of goo, but if you look closely with your magnifying glass that by now I hope you realize is going to be your constant companion, and you may discover that that goo is a dozen skeleton shrimp, as in this photo. And in case you can't quite make them out, here is a video of one moving about in its typical skeleton shrimp fashion. And that dark orange blob on the bottom left. I hope you recognize that as a nudibranch. Now, some shore creatures are best left alone. I'm told that clam worms like this one on the left can inflict quite the bite. So if you see one of these beauties, best to admire from afar. And in contrast to big clam worms, spiral tube worms are teensy. And while you may notice the small right, white spiral shells on rocks and seaweed, you may not have realized that there are bright orange worms inside who come out to feed when they are underwater. We have several kinds of anemones on the coast of Maine, and these ones are frilled anemones, and they look quite different underwater than when they're exposed at low tide, as you can see from the photo on the left and the bottom middle. And you can find these anemones attached to rocks, and in the case of the one on the bottom right, attached to a scrap of mussel shell, which is itself attached to a sea urchin. The other very common anemones are northern serianthid, or burrowing anemones. When exposed at low tide, their tentacles fold up like fingernails and hair and occasionally look like the legs of rockets, which is a reference that I realize dates me. And if you are walking along the tide line at a super low tide, which happens at the new and full moons in the morning or evening, especially in spring, you'll see them poking out of the muddy bottom, waiting to be covered by the sea to spread their tentacles and feed. And if you step near them, they'll quickly retract into their burrows. Over the 26 years that we've lived in Maine, I've seen sea stars come and go. Sadly, some people have been collecting them to sell to biological supply companies, and there are areas that were formerly covered in sea stars where there are hardly any at all anymore. This has disrupted the ecosystems in those areas too. But at our shore, a couple of summers ago, it was a sea star extravaganza. The photo on the left is just a single rock of many that were completely covered by sea stars. They denuded the rock of barnacles, which you can see on the bottom right, and the following summer, there were baby barnacles covering all the rocks along the shore. Sea stars are echinoderms, and there are two very common species, forbs and northern sea stars. You can tell them apart by the color of their madroporite, which is the disc on the top that's used to filter water and that serves like a trap door through which water can move in and out in a controlled manner. Forbs generally have an orange or pink madreporite, 
and northern usually have a cream or yellow madreporite. Now the sea stars themselves come in such a variety of colors. I took all but one of these photos, the blood star on the bottom right, in just 10 minutes, which shows you the variety of color in just a small area. Now my favorite sea stars are brittle stars, which generally live under rocks, so they are less visible. visible. They also move much faster than northern or Forbes sea stars, and here is a video of them and the way they move. Some of you noticed the um, the two worms that are uh, behind the brittle star, as well as the star tunicates, which you can also see in this video. So it's common to find razor clam shells on the shore at low tide, but much less common to ever see a living razor clam. This one, which was found by one of our dogs who barked incessantly, upon his discovery, booked it back home, as you can see. Now, my last video, which is coming up next, represents a labor of love. Among my favorite creatures in Maine are jellyfish. I find them mesmerizing. I filmed them over the years on my paddleboard with my waterproof camera, and I put together this final video that includes white cross and moon jellies, like the one on the right, various comb jellies, like the one on the left, that aren't actually jellyfish at all, but are in the phylum Tenophora, and ends with the big stinging lion's mane, like the one in the middle, whom I often see by the dozens in late spring by our home on Patton Bay, where I photographed this one. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't end this presentation with the suggestion to look beyond our state and even our planet by gazing upward. 
Sometimes we are gifted with the wonder of a comet, like Neowise that streaked through our night skies a couple of years ago. These two photos were taken by Edwin, and they remind me that we are part of a miraculous universe. The natural world beckons, so please do go outside. And if you've found yourself falling in love with nature and other living beings a bit more through this presentation, I hope that you will do all you can to protect them. And should you want to become a humane educator and teach others about the interconnected issues of environmental sustainability, animal protection, and human rights, be in touch. The Institute for Humane Education is here to help with loads of free downloadable resources, online courses, and an online graduate program with Antioch University. To keep learning, and enjoying videos and photos, I also invite you to subscribe to my husband's blog, Nature Unveiled, which is hosted at our son's website, forestbarkdahlweil.com. And I just want to say a couple words about the photos and the videos that I've shared with you. Clearly, I am not a National Geographic photographer and certainly not videographer. But even though you can see more amazing videos, if you watch nature specials, I wanted you to be able to see photos from just an amateur going outside near her home, not traveling far at all. All of what you saw today is within a relatively few miles of where I live, and I don't have a particularly fancy camera. I just have one with a really good zoom function and one with a very good macro function. So I just like to thank the main master naturalist program, my husband Edwin Barkdahl, naturalists and nature writers and scientists sharing new knowledge all the time. And now I will stop sharing and I will be happy to answer anybody's questions. I do see there are comments in the chat, but I won't be able to read them and answer questions. So if there are any there that I should answer, Suzanne, just let me know. I see Barbara has her hand up. And feel free to um, uh, maybe not unmute yourself unless you're speaking, but um, to start your videos up so I can see you if you want to be seen. Well, first of all, Thank you so much. This was just beyond compare. Um, the music background is, I don't have words for it. So thank you, thank your husband. But I need some reassurance. Um, this morning, a neighbor called me. I live in Agunkwa, which is not exactly rural. It's pretty urban. And I, I live on a street with many houses. I have a pumpkin in front that I've kept for all creatures to come and finish. And my neighbor called early this morning and said, look out your window. And there's a deer eating the pumpkin. Um, and I was stunned because it's a long way from home, I think, for that deer to be here. Um, she didn't keep the pumpkin very long before it rolled downhill. And then she went to the shrubs and bushes. But I worry, <laughs> I worry about the deer. What are they eating? Is it sustenance? I mean, clearly they're fine and they're procreating and life is good for them. But still, I have so many unanswered questions. Um, she doesn't have a shaggy coat. She was alone. How is she surviving? You know, I'm going to lob that question to my husband um, because he's uh, he's a veterinarian and probably knows more about that. Edwin, can you weigh in on that? Sure. Uh, let me unmute uh, here. Hi there. Hi. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I've got to close the door because the echo is driving just, me crazy. Just come here, unmute yourself, come here and talk through here. Okay. We're just in 
rooms adjacent to each other. Hi there. Um, so yeah, great question. So there, you know, natural brows in the winter is uh, twigs. Um, you know, you may see a browse line uh, in in uh, with evergreens, uh, but they will eat uh, maples or dogwoods, whatever uh, is available like that. Um, uh, one thing that I have encountered or uh, have been asked uh, before is, is it okay to put out things like uh, corn and oats and that sort of thing for for them because you see them and you want want to help them uh, survive the winter. Um, but actually food like that can be really problematic. That is, uh, you know, supplemental feeding with things like cracked corn or oats, uh, because as winter comes, uh, as it arrives, uh, their gut, their flora, their intestinal flora, their bacteria, their uh, their microorganisms actually change from uh, uh, summer and fall uh, to a different uh, flora, if you will. Um, and they can really have problems digesting things like uh, corn and oats, uh, problems to the point of, you know, some, uh, some deer, if they overeat, uh, can actually die from it. So uh, I don't know if that helps answer your question or not. Um, but, you know, so as long as there's a natural forage for them, uh, they, they tend to do pretty well. Good to hear. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs> you might be needed again, honey. Don't go too far. <laughs> so there aren't any questions in the chat, but I see Ray has has a hand raised. Hi, Ray. Okay, so y'all, I have to tell you that, that Ray Sakura here, she is the co-founder of the Institute for Humane Education with me. And it's so great that you're here. Thank you for coming. Oh, it made me so happy, all of it. Like, but especially our house filled with the loon calls, the best. <laughs> it was so great. So my friend Carrie is here with me. I don't know, she just went away. But we're both watching. And we want to know what's behind you with the little ladder and the hole. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Edwin and my son Forrest, when he was a little boy, one of the like second grade school project was to build a home from um, somebody else's kind of home, but a human home. And so he built um, this uh, house uh, on the water, these houses built on sticks with thatch on the water. And I can't throw things like that away. <laughs> so it's still here. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much for this. Oh my God. I, and then my other question is because there's so many people who I want to see it and hear it, um is there another time you're going to do it or is there a way for people to somehow see it who weren't available today well it's being um taped so once we have the link and i suzanne said that would be by the end of the week we can you can share it with anyone which is great oh. and mm -hmm. i um ray happens to be the biggest fan of um, Edwin's blog, Nature Unveiled. And so I'm putting into the chat um, Forrest's website, forrestbartallwild.com. And if you go to his website and you just click on the blog, you can, if you read any of the blogs, you can then subscribe. So if you liked this, you're going to love that. And they come out about every two weeks and they're pretty short. And they're the best blog. Like it's the only one I read like religiously. I yeah, she doesn't. Even, Ray doesn't even read my blog, but she reads no, no, yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this. So it was fantastic. Oh, thanks for coming, Ray. <laughs> Hi, I, I can you hear me? I can. Yes. You can. Oh, okay, great. I wasn't sure if it was my turn or not. Uh, I'm I'm Debbie, and I so enjoyed this very much. This was beautiful, and the beauty of the creatures is just exquisite. So thank you for giving us a chance to see it and 
not be affecting their movement or anything at the same time. It's been wonderful. Uh, one of my questions was with that razor clam of all the creatures, this is the one I kind of zoomed in on myself because for years I've found razor clam shells and I often wondered what is their life cycle? I just haven't researched it. But when you find a shell like that, how old is that clam at that point? And I was astonished how it would lift itself up and go down into the sand. So do they start out underground developing and they're already in the sand or, and they just emerge maybe when they die in the shells? Just well, a lot I'm of questions. The, I'm looking to the side because I have no idea. Um, at okay. all. I've never actually done any research on razor clams. Edwin, do you happen to know any questions? Um, uh, anything about like that razor clam is that how was that an adult? I mean, obviously it was an adult, but was it, was your question like, how big are they when they're born? Are they under, under the sand then? Like, do you know anything about razor clam life cycle? Uh, not really. (laughs) (laughs) I'll, I'll look it up. That's okay. I I just happened to realize that that was something I hadn't thought about in a while. (laughs) But thank you very much. And I'm so impressed by your, your website regarding the philosophy of the school. I just came across it. Uh, I'm trying to think of how I found it, actually. I, I, anyways, I came across your website, and um, it reminds me of a school where I retired from in some ways, in terms of some of the philosophy. So I'm excited about what you are doing in education. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Deborah. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Oh, I see we're a few minutes after one. Um, Do you have time for one more question from Audra and Anna Kate? Absolutely. I I can stay on as long as, uh, you know, up till 115. So, okay. Um, So how old were the baby deer? Oh, they were really young. I mean, um, the, in the, the, when they were nursing with their mom, um, they couldn't have been more than a few weeks old. Um, And the very end of that video, uh, they were um, a couple months old. So, but they were, the beginning, they were very, very young. How, uh, I mean, not how, um, how did Mr. Van not get stung by the jellyfish? Could you say that again? Stung by the jellyfish. How did I not, you know, that is a good question. Um, (laughs) I have never gotten stung by any of the jellyfish that I have videotaped, even though I am, you know, I have my little waterproof camera, I'm holding it under the water, their tentacles are all around, but I just, I guess I've been careful enough to keep my hands away from the tentacles, even though I'm so mesmerized by them that I'm often not paying close enough attention, but I've never gotten stung. But I really don't want to fall off my paddleboard because then I really will get stung because sometimes there are so many of them. They are literally just, you know, every couple of feet, I will see jellyfish for maybe a week in the spring and then they sort of disappear again. But you do need to be careful with those. The other jellyfish that you saw don't sting, but the lion's mane jellyfish, I am told, will inflict quite a bad sting. Any Does other questions? Anyone else have a question? Mm-hmm. Yes, go ahead. I um, was wondering, um, why were the starfish different colors? Were they the same breed? Yeah, they're, I don't know why they come in different colors. Um, maybe just like people, they come in different colors. And um, they're, in that particular um, slide, there was only one that was a, you know, a very different species, the blood star. But the northern and the forbs, they just come in that variety of colors. <laughs> 